Hello, this is Carl Ackerman, host of History Is Here to Help, and we are so pleased today to have Sonny Donenfeld here from Punahou School, but someone who also spent a great deal of time at USC. And of course, we are a show focused on the humanities, but the question is, how does one get support for the humanities and sustain it? So that um, Sonny is someone who can tell us all about this because he is in charge of doing this right now at Punahou School, but before that, he was in charge of doing this at USC. So, Sonny, I'm going to ask you to give our audience a little bit of about your history before. Sure. I'll give the abbreviated version, Carl. I spent 25 years in higher education, uh, starting my career at Stanford University, moving to Cornell, and then most recently at USC before I was... Uh, courted to come to Hawaii and thankfully uh, made the right decision and joined Punamo School. So this is my first foray into K-12 independent schools, and I've been here about three years. Um, I have an undergraduate degree from State University of New York at Binghamton and went to grad school at Cornell University. Well, that is a distinguished uh, resume right there. I mean, that's a nice way to start. So, you know, this program today is all about careful stewardship. And um, I guess, you know, the first question um, that I would have for you is, um, you, what do you see as your main goals in your position now and in your position at USC? Um, what are the things that, you know, you think about all day? Um, and we'll get down to the, the nitty gritties uh, in a bit. But, um, you know, what do you think about, what do you think about, you know, um, your purpose um, you know, your professional purpose, not your personal pur purpose, but your professional purpose. Well, I'm going to start at the 30,000 foot level, um, Carl. I think what, what my goal is, what I try to achieve on a daily basis is to advance the mission of the institution and not for profits like universities or K-12 schools are not beholden to shareholders. Um, but we do have an, a, a goal of advancing our mission. And we can advance the mission if we're not careful stewards of our resources. And another way to think about it is the more resources we have and the better we steward them, the more we could advance our mission. That's, that's, a, that's a, good, a good point to start from. Now, of course, um, Punahou School and USC are private institutions. Um, so, you know, where is money generated from? And then once this money is generated, you know, where do you, where do you keep it? And of course you probably want to, um, you may want to start with tuition, but you, you, right. you're the expert, not me. So they're really, for all intents and purposes, two sources of revenue. Um, and, and we can quibble about some other small, uh, parts of the pie, but the two sources are revenue, which in institutions like, I'm sorry, our tuition, which institutions like Punho make up the bulk of our revenue and advancement or, or donations, whether it's from individuals or foundations, which makes up a small but significant part of, of our revenue pie. So those are really the only two sources. And so we have to be very careful about um, how we approach each of those. For instance, we could probably, uh, again, at any institution, just turn on the faucet in terms of um, expenditures and keep raising tuition you started with uh, the concept of sustainability, and that might work for a year or two or even five, maybe even 10, but soon you'd be locking out. Uh, a lot of people wouldn't be able to access that education that we really think is an important part of making a great education in a diverse student body. So we, the more careful we are on the expense side, the more um, we can do to keep this, uh, this institution inclusive and accessible everybody you know what what and, and what this does you know um and just for me to make a, a commentary because this is about history is that you know you allow your historians at usc and your historians um at uh, punahou to have a great deal of freedom and um and the resources are there for kind of copying material getting film you know getting video is having the best computers available and and you know resources that um can help um uh, uh, you know, if a computer breaks down, uh, to fix those computers and things like that, which is always such a treasure, something that is not affordable generally in the, um, in, in, in the public sector, um, you know, with, with public education. So, uh, my next question to you is, 
So when you look out at the vast resources of something like a USC or a, a Punahou school, and as you mentioned, vast only because the money is continually coming in, um, and that's not a guarantee. What's, what are your concerns on a daily basis? What are you, what, what, you know, and maybe the concerns, uh, there may be some concerns that keep you up at night. Um, yeah. what, are the, what are the basic issues? Well, I think what, I, I would be careful with the words vast resources because I think the, some people interpret that as endless resources or unlimited resources or infinite resources. And by definition, you know, no resource is, is infinite about at, at Punahou. And I think it's similar at many other schools, the vast majority of our resources go back to the, the employees, you know, our faculty and, and our staff are paid very competitively. And so about, um, you know, 70% of our budget goes to that. So when you ask, what am I, what do I think about? What am I concerned about? I think we have this really wonderful balance of autonomy versus let's say centralization and autonomy means faculty can explore and do some really neat things that end up becoming part of Uno for the, for the long term. And I'll share two examples that, that come to mind. Uh, one is the glass studio that, that we recently celebrated our uh, 50th anniversary of glass blowing. That's something that never would have happened if we didn't have this sense of autonomy for, for the faculty to create something exciting and new and different and unique that most schools don't have. Another, of course, is, is the Pueo program. Um, and I'm sure you've spoken about this in, in another podcast, but what an exciting program. What a great way for Puno to do outreach and have a, a really big impact on the island and on Hawaii. That's not something we would do if we discourage faculty from trying new things. So autonomy on the one end is amazing. And on the other, it's a little bit scary for me from, from where I sit because it it automatically means we're going to try things, some of which will succeed, some of which, of which won't, but all of which requires some uh, infusion of resources, whether it's people's time or tuition dollars. And in the end, I think it's very beneficial to an institution like ours, but that balance, again, has to be has to be a good sustainable balance. Well, you mentioned the um, the glass blowing and um, and uh, there's a funny story related to this. I'll be quick. Um, you know, when the former headmaster, um, uh, or the pr former president of Puno, um, uh, Jim Scott, was on the East Coast one time doing I don't know what, what kind of tour, and uh, someone came up to him and said, "Oh, Puno School, I know it well." And of course, at that time, Barack Obama was president, and so J Jim expected, okay he's going to start talking or she's going to start talking about President Obama. And the, the person said, oh, you have great glass blowing at that school. And so I thought that was, that was great. Well, Sonny, um, you know, you have, you mentioned um, the Pueo program, the, you know, the Clarence T.C. Ching uh, Pueo program. And of course, I think what most in our audience don't know about Punahou School is that Punahou spends, um, you know, if you if you take in kind um, monies also um, um, into account, about a million dollars on public education every year um, through the Pueo program. And um, what you know, these are kind of initiatives that are you know quite exciting. And so let me ask you about two other things. Um, from your perspective, because you mentioned the independence of faculty, how did that contribute to, for example, the Japanese uh, language teachers? developing a book that's now used all across the United States and donating uh, most of the revenues from their, uh, from their book, you know, which was over a million dollars um, um, about five or 10 years ago. So that must be more now. And the current thing, I think one of the most exciting things that's happening at Punahou School is that uh, Asian history textbook, because Punahou teaches Asian history, one of the few schools to do so in the country, um, written by Robert Stratton, Dr. Robert Stratton. So how does... How does specifically um, that relate to what you just said? Uh, how do how are teachers empowered to do sort of things like that? You know, from a fiscal or perspective, from your perspective. Well, first, and if I haven't mentioned this, I've been in Punahou now just going on three years, so I can't speak firsthand. But I have I, I'm quite familiar with both of the examples you shared, and and it's actually really amazing for a school to provide leadership, say, to other schools in terms of the textbook, whether it's Japanese language 
or the Asian history course and where we sit in the Pacific, I think we're, uh, we in Hawaii are uniquely positioned to be leaders in say things like Asian history or Japanese language in the U S so that just in and of itself is exciting. And it's the, the very positive side about faculty autonomy. Um, but what's, what we don't see, you know, by definition, it's hard to see the things that don't work out. Um, but we can't focus on that and say, well, you know, these four things didn't work out and this one thing was amazing, but we're not going to take risks anymore. But I think we have to be thoughtful and careful about the risks we take because at the end of the day, and this is something I, I talk about regularly here, it's parents tuition money for the most part that's funding all of our endeavors. And so we want to be thoughtful and careful about how we earn it and how we um, innovate. And at the same time, we want to have a culture where innovation is, is not so that's tolerated, but it's welcome. And, you know, I wanted to ask you, because I know your son was a student at Punahou School last year, and I want to ask you this question. Do you ever get the time, because you're kind of centrally located on the, on the campus, to sort of walk around and see the many um, splendors, both at, both at when you were at USC and at, um, at Punahou mm -hmm. School? I'm just I, 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 that, that's the best part of the job. I'm so fortunate to be on a beautiful campus where I can just walk outside my office and not just observe, but take part in what's going on. And I'll share a quick anecdote. Um, I, I approached the principal of the junior school, Todd Chow Hoy, and asked how I might get more involved in the junior school. Uh, you know, I lecture a couple times a year in different classes in the academy, and I thought he might invite me to teach a, you know, personal finance or money management course for very young people. And without missing a beat, he said, gee, we can use some help serving lunch in K-1. And then I said, <laughs> Okay, I'm up for that. I'll pay. So once a month last uh, semester, I went over to uh, Omidyar and served lunch for uh, K and one, and it was actually just a really sweet reminder of one of the most precious parts of our school. These kids at this age were really learning about basic skills, you know, how to ask for more, how to um, clean off their trees, and how to compost this part and how to recycle that part. It's, it's really neat. I sit on the academy side, sort of in the middle of the campus and having an excuse to do something that I never would have thought of doing is actually enriching. But even just the, the fauna and flora here, there, there's always some white turn that, you know, is nesting uh, in a building around here, in, in a tree around here and to be able to walk around and just take five minutes out of the day to experience that is, is really a gift. That's great. Now I'm going to um, ask you a question because I, one of our, oh, uh, well, first let me say that you, you joined Rod McPhee, who is, uh, you know, the president before Jim Scott, when he was having a particularly tough day at Punahou, he would, um, or he told me this, that he would walk up to the, um, to, you know, K or first grade and just sit there and watch the kids. And I, I, what a wonderful thing to do, you know, to, mm -hmm. to keep you, um, um, inspired. So what a, what a great thing, Sonny. So, um, my question is, you know, uh, Dr. Jim Scott, you know, before Mike Latham became president, always said that about 80% of, um, uh, is covered by tuition and the other 20% is covered by, you know, advancement. And so what that means is that, you know, that every Puno parent really is only paying 80% of what it costs to educate their child. Are those the figures that you would associate or are they different now? Those figures are exactly the same today. And it's true. And we talked to to parents, you know, it's it, it's a it's a big commitment to send your child here, and you know, for many families, it's a, a genuine, real commitment. You have great, generous financial aid, but it's still a commitment for many families. Um, to me, it's more of a reminder of how we have to be careful stewards, rather than, hey, education costs more than the cost price of tuition, so you should be happy. That's not the message. That's not what it's. You know, yeah, tuition doesn't care, cover everything. Fortunately, we have a really great advancement team that, and very generous donors um, who are alum, alums of the school and friends of the school and foundations in town that are, we're, we're just very grateful to have. But, but when I hear numbers like that, I just feel like we have to redouble our efforts to make sure we're good stewards on the expense side. We talked about innovation. That's not really where the issues are. It's 
um, you know, how, how, how can we at every moment be thinking, this is some parents' dollars that we're spending when, you know, we, we want our faculty to get great professional development and they do. And when they travel, how can they be thinking as they travel, you know, how do I travel responsibly? How do I make sure that this is all sustainable? So that it's true. Tuition does not cover the full cost of education at Puna Hall, and we have to be great stewards in how we spend our money. And, you know, I just have to make a personal commentary, having been a, um, a teacher at Puna Hall for 28 years before I uh, uh, retired and I'm doing every, other things like this show, um, I felt I was treated very uh, well. I thought my pay was extraordinarily generous, and I also, I also felt that our retirement um, um, you know, uh, our ability to save for retirement was very easy, easy. So I'm thanking you on behalf of all the vice presidents that have been at Puto back to the, back to the 19th century. Yes. You've been very good to teachers. So thank you, Sonny. I'm thanking you as a well, representative. I, I would just have to, before I let that go, I just have to thank the teachers here. Um, because yeah, we can say, could, you know, compared to, you know, the market, we feel we're doing well, but what te teachers jobs are, are so big and so important. And, you know, the, the teachers I talk with, they're, they're motivated by so much more. Um, and it's a hard, it, from my perspective, I like to joke, but it's not really a joke. I lecture once or twice a year. So that's like three hours a year, let's say, and I'm exhausted. Like, okay, no more meetings the rest of the day. I just <laughs> lectured an hour and a half and took some really hard questions from, so I could not imagine, you know, at whether it's the junior school or the academy school, just how much uh, talent and hard work goes into that. So I, I really appreciate our teachers. And I, and I think you're, you're, the teachers at Puna Hall, from um, what you just described, are, are really are very interested in their subjects. And they and I think you're right about this. I think they get great uh, joy out of lecturing, out of uh, working in groups with um, with uh, with teachers. You know, what comes to mind is that great uh, scholar of Western history that's on your faculty, Bonnie Christensen. Um, who is, you know, not only a great scholar, but someone who really enjoys teaching U.S. history. And I don't think there's anyone in the country that is, well, th there may be people as good, but no one better than Bonnie Christensen in terms of teaching um, U.S. history. And um, I, I just was, uh, as an aside, study, just a, a brief anecdote. Um, I was just at uh, uh, Washington Place, and I was there for a, um, a celebration of, of the Weinberg Foundation and its new trustee. But um uh, a Puna Ho student of mine, like 95, came running up to me. You know, he's a prominent lawyer in town and said, oh, Dr. Ackerman, I so enjoyed your history class. And I think, you know, that's, you know, you know, what kid does that, you know, every six months and you think, oh, I really, you know, enjoyed myself. But back to you, Sonny. So you were also a father of a student and you and your, your wife were, were parents of a student. So how did you see the school, given your financial stewardship? stewardship and making everything possible. How did you see the school from that perspective? Because that's a different perspective. I, I have to say, when we were first considering coming here, we looked at the course catalog and we we're kind of blown away by it. And it was a tough decision because our son was going into 10th grade at the time, which isn't a typical year to, to start and, you know, making new friends. But that just seeing what was available was so compelling to all of us. And um, to see him take courses like glass blowing. Now he's not going to go into glass blowing as a career, but to you know experience that, to experience he he um he was searching in the catalog in his last semester for any course that his favorite science teacher was going to teach just because he had such a great experience. So from uh you know just in terms of the academics, it was really exciting. But I I'll tell you that um the surprise for us was where he kind of found his home. And we hear, you know, every kid finds their place at Puno, whether it's in glass blowing or in science or in choir or in orchestra. And uh, our son's not a big athlete. And I don't think he'd mind me saying that, but he ended up becoming the statistics manager for the varsity volleyball team, which had an amazing up and down season ending with the state championship. And the the coach, Rick Toon, became that adult that we had heard. Every kid finds an adult they trust who kind of mentors them. We never in a million years would have thought, oh, I bet volleyball, anything in athletics was going to be the thing he found. And it changed his life. 
absolutely changed his life. He felt so included. He felt the sense of belonging. The team kind of adopted him in a way as just one of the players, even though he didn't play. He was celebrated on senior night along with the other players. He, you know, got the award for the state championships. And it was it was life changing in terms of being part of a team. And we never would have expected that. So that was for us as parents, the Punahou surprise about wow, you know, anything's possible here. And, and given the, you know, the success of the the book and movie Moneyball, you know, there may be a future career for him in this. That's just that's a, and that's a what a wonderful career. You know, yeah. And I, he worked for Billy B to the Oakland A's. Isn't that great? Unit. Yeah, to get a job with a professional, you know, and who would have thought? Because, you know, it, I guess in our time too, there are the people who love the statistics and the people who play the games. But wow. Um, yeah, I think anything's possible. And that's, that's, you know, it's Puno, it's schools like us. Um, you know, they, they really can, as our new mission statement talks about, this is the place to dream and discover. And, you know, it, it's always a surprise, especially from the parent perspective. That's a, that's a great story. Now, let me ask you as we're, you know, sort of concluding this interview, um, you report, um, to, uh, that wonderful historian who is president of Punahou School, Michael Latham. And it, what a joy to have a, you know, it must be to have a historian who is sober about everything, um, you know, uh, as, as president of the school, but you report to the board of directors. And I, and I wanted to ask you about that, about, you know, um, because you have, um, you know, wonderful people on, on the Punahou board, like John Morgan, um, who is, you know, my ideal businessman and, and the business community awarded him. So I'm not speaking just alone, but um, what is that like? And, and, you know, the people seem to be, you know, um, all come on uh, and um, very friendly, but I wanted to ask you about uh, that because that's, that's who you report. Well, well, I mean, technically I report to the president, Mike Latham, but I work very closely with the board. And I think when I came here, I just saw the board as sort of a monolith. They're the board, but really it's, it's 16 individual personalities, 16 individual skill sets, 16 individual histories. Um, they're all really proven in what they do, whether it's running businesses, being leaders in philanthropy, being leaders on other boards. And, and you mentioned John, but I, you could really mention each of them, but John, talk about an innovator and an innovative mindset. What he's done on Kualoa Ranch is incredible. I always transformed it. And each of the board members has something uh, to offer. You know, the finance chair, David Carey, who ran out of rigor, has, you know, helped us bring in a financial discipline that I, I think is really exciting, at least for finance nerds like myself. Um, but each and every one, our, our outgoing uh, board chair, Ani Lau, is proven businesswoman. She, I mean, you think there's nothing left to prove, and yet here she is working with us, involved, uh, you know, at, at a really high level. Our incoming chair, Wendy Crabb, is a really different personality, but just as dedicated, has just as much to offer us. And um, and I got to know her as part of the volleyball family, and. Uh, you know, really excited about the next two years with, with her at the helm. And, you know, speaking of Wendy Crabb, wasn't she a volleyball player herself? Or like a celebrated <laughs> one in California or something? Am I, am I, am I, and I, 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 can't speak, I can't speak to her career, but, um, we know her, her, she's so involved. She has a grandson, uh, who started on the volleyball team, the varsity volleyball team here in eighth grade and another grandson on the UH team. I just graduated, uh, and she's just done a, a wonderful supporter supporter and uh just has so much aloha for Punahou. so yeah yeah and, and we could go through the board one by one and talk about not just their proven qualities but what good people they are so i i feel very fortunate to be to be able to be mentored even as the, i don't think people on the board would think they're mentoring me but i feel that i get mentorship from pretty much each and every one of them in one way or another. That's a lovely relationship to have because having the, um, you know, mentee, ment mentor or um, relationship is always a, a very good one. So, you know, I'm going to leave the last couple of minutes to you in terms of, now you moved here from Los Angeles and um, I'm sure the culture, um, having grown up as, she, as, as you and I have talked about before, having grown up in Santa Monica and Malibu, I, the culture is very different. Um, in Los in the Los Angeles area, then in Honolulu, and uh, you've adapted well. You know, you, you 
you're wearing those beautiful red and uh, Aloha shirts already. And so I, I want to ask you, you know, what was that transition like for, you know, for you and your wife? Um, mm-hmm. uh, because that's a big, that's a big transition to any place in the country, much less, you know, moving to a wonderful spot with tremendous history um, in the Middle East. I'll start with, we love it here and could see, could easily see never moving again. Um, we really love it here. But it's hard to talk about the transition without talking about the pandemic. My um, assistant at USC used to work for American Airlines, and we it was the um, mid, you know the beginning of the pandemic. We were all freaked out, and I asked her, you know, she offered to contact her friend to see which flights were kind of empty because we were nervous about getting it. Our mother-in-law was uh, living with us, my mother-in-law, and. Um, I'll never forget, we we left on June 27, 2020, and we were the only passengers in Terminal 4 at LAX. Like, the whole, there are a couple people who were working, we saw some flight crews, and it was us, the four of us, <laughs> you know, in this empty terminal. So coming here was kind of scary, and they, and we did, um, we, we had to do the quarantine for two weeks, and uh, when we got out, we went to Servco and got a car. And then we went to Nico's on Pier 38, and that was like day one out of, <laughs> and that was scary too. Like, are we too close to anyone? But I have to say the big difference, and and it sounds trivial, but um, first, people are very open. It was very easy to make friends here for, for our son, but for us too. It, people were very open, and that was easy. But we had friends in LA too, but the idea of like, do we want to go to Pasadena on a Saturday at noon to see them and spend an hour and a half on the freeway. Like they're, they're, it was just a pain to see people. Whereas here it's so easy. So we, we see our friends frequently. We're building friendships. People come over, we go to their places, we go out together. You know, we had a new year's party at our house two years in a row, one sort of a pandemic um, protocol where people would come in and when it got too many people, people would go out. But it, it, it's been great. It's a, it's a, a wonderful community. And of course it's a complex place and there's a lot to learn. And the more I know, the more I realize I don't know. Um, but I read about a dozen books about Hawaii, both fiction and nonfiction in my first year here. And, um, there's just so much to learn, so much to know, so many people to meet, so much history, some of which is really hard and some of which I think is really exciting. Um. But yeah, we, we were very grateful to have had a reason to come here. And before I ramble on it any further, I'll let you wrap it up. Yeah, well, thank you, Sonny. This has been a you know, really wonderful um, interview. And I will leave you with this. The only thing I would suggest is before that VP, uh, which identifies you, you should use the word mensch too. So oh. thank you, Sonny. This has been delightful. Um, you know, And I think that everyone in our audience will now understand um, a great deal about financial stewardship and how important it is and um, the role that you play uh, that you played at USC and also at Punahou School. Thank you, Sonny. Thank you. Pleasure was mine. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please click the like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Check out our website, thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.